There is a whole host of regulations coming in that's affecting financial services, those being uh, good examples of it, as well as PSD2 and open banking with MIFID and GDPR and others. And of course, from any traditional institution, they're going to need to stay compliant, and they're good at staying compliant. Um, I've heard estimates of having um, anywhere from 30 to 50,000 people within a bank working just in the compliance function. Um, so they're definitely resourced to, to appropriately respond to some of these new legislative pieces that are coming through. Um, but what I think is really interesting is the government, particularly in the UK, the regulator is very adamant around supporting competition, supporting innovation, really enabling a framework that helps that to happen. And so while these pieces of regulation are creating mandates for the banks, it's really also helping them to stay competitive. So they can comply to the minimum, which is what we're seeing. They just kind of do the thing to check the box. Like, okay, they've done PSD2. But if they actually comply with the spirit of it and how it's transforming the user experience and transforming the way that business models work, it actually helps them to stay competitive. Because as technology is changing rapidly, particularly within financial technology, the traditional institutions will also need to be changing to keep up. And the legislation actually is just something that's kind of forcing them to do that. And so in a way, it's keeping them competitive with the new fintechs that are starting up. Um, additionally, some of the new legislation is around helping new entrants to get banking licenses. So we've seen that quite a bit in the UK. We've had at one point like 40 plus banking licenses like in progress. Um, but for the fintechs alike, so when you see this new regulation, it means that all of a sudden they have to be very much resourced and willing and ad to adapt, to adhere to them as it changes um, any of their internal policies and practices. Um, at Starling, with this marketplace we have and the open APIs, we also have a rigorous due diligence process that we do for each of these. Um, so as part of that, for example, when we look at a third party to plug into our marketplace, we review their data protection policy, their information security, their terms of service, their privacy policy, and we mandate that they're already compliant with GDPR. So we are mandating that before GDPR even went in. And we're a fintech, but we're a bank. And then there's also fintechs um, but that want to work with banks. And so they need to rapidly be changing their practices in order to be compliant, in order to kind of be in this ecosystem. So it's creating opportunities, but also very much uh, enabling a certain type of competition. Open banking is certainly set to transform and revolutionize the banking industry, and we're already seeing that happen today. The reason why is it because it shifts the technology and the business models that traditional banks are used to. So in this world where you have open APIs, it means customers have more transparency around their options. They can easily compare their options for any given financial service. But what that means also is because APIs are this connective layer between two different entities, it means that they can much more easily access them as well. So one, all of a sudden where these traditional institutions, they were known for having complex pricing, it was hard for customers to understand how much they had to pay, much less compare it with someone else and how much they would have to pay there, much less go through the hassle of switching. Now all of a sudden, that's completely broken the mold. It's transparent and it's easy to access. So if you've ever, for an example of how you'd use an API, if you've logged onto a new service using your Facebook login or your Gmail saying like, just use Facebook to log in, you don't have to create another username and password, that's using APIs. And so all of a sudden, if I want to access some other like insurance product using my Starling login, that's something that will be possible. So it's completely disruptive because traditional banks, the way that they make money is they incentivize you to join the current account, but then they upsell all these higher profit financial products. So now if all of a sudden all of these FinTech players are offering these financial products at a much lower price and stealing all the customer's business in a very easy and accessible way. Um, that's a huge shift. So the banks, they not only have to build the technology, the APIs, but they really have to think, if we are reduced to the current account, if that's what we offer, and that's not that's loss making for us, that's a loss leader, then what do we do? And so for Starling, we were very much built with PSD2 and open banking and open APIs in mind. So that's why we built the API and locks up with our current product. But it's very much building a completely different model where we just do the core account and then we help to introduce our customers to all the different products from across the market. Um, blockchain is a very hot topic. Uh, it would be difficult to go to an event or a conference in financial services and not have it come up. Um, if nothing else, it's kind of joke that if you want to create, increase your valuation, just add the word blockchain to what you do. You know, Starling Bank, a blockchain bank. We're not, you know, but yeah. Um, but, it, and, you know, and there's so many ICOs now. It's becoming quite trendy. Um, to be honest, though, we're not seeing it as much from traditional institutions. I think that's another area where it's a hot topic, but yet we're not seeing a lot of action out of it. Whereas with open APIs, it's a hot topic, but we're actively seeing uh, it being implemented across the industry. Um, so I think it could be revolutionary as well, but it's just a bit earlier on in its adoption throughout the market, so it'll take a bit of time.